Hi, Robin Vermont here. Welcome to the second tutorial about p-values. Again, I'm making use of some excellent material by Professor Chris Wilds, and hopefully the picture of horror is fading with time. In the last tutorial, we looked at the probability aspect of the p-value. I am now going to look at the sampling aspects of the p-value. How will you find me revisiting the probability aspect again several times as we gain more knowledge and enable us to express our thoughts in a more sophisticated manner? In the last tutorial, we discovered that the p-value is a special type of probability. It's a conditional probability which also takes into account a range of outcomes. Specifically, it considers a single value obtained from our data set and all those values that are more extreme than it that could have been attained from our data set given that the value in some such larger group is equal to a specific value. Actually, the data set I referred to technically is called a sample and the larger group is the population from which it comes. It is essential that you see the differences between samples and populations even if it is only at the theoretical rather than practical level. So let's start. Accepting the assumptions of the quantitative world means that it's possible to measure things. Here we have a population from which we can take samples. Unfortunately, rarely do we know details of the population, but sometimes we are lucky. For example, we just happen to know all the heights of girls aged 12 in New Zealand for a specific year. In this rare situation, we can calculate the exact mean for the population. Here we have a summary value of the population which we will consider to be the mean in that box. Actually it's the median but it doesn't matter for this purpose. Partly because it's at the population level it is called a parameter. Parameter values can create populations. For example if we specify that we want a population with a mean value of say 155 centimeters and a standard deviation of 5 we can use a mathematical formula or a computer which would say uses one to create such a population and it probably would do a very good job of mimicking the actual population there that we can see of heights of girls. Also we can take a random sample and see how close our estimated mean is to the true value in the population. The process of calculating a summary statistic value from a sample and considering how it relates to the parent population is called making an inference. You must always be very clear at which level we are working sample or population or transversing between the two. Summary values for the sample are called estimates or statistics, i.e. a statistic usually means a summary value at the sample level, whereas for the population the same value is called a parameter or population value. How does all this relate to the concept of a p-value? Well the p-value takes information from both levels. First, the hypothesized value, that is a conditional part of it, is at the population level. In contrast, the summary value, plus those values more extreme, is at the sample level. Let's look a little more how the sample aspect works. Here is a random sample of 30 girls' measurements. And there is a box plot of the values. The mean of our random sample appears to provide a precise measure of the mean of the population for which it came. In the diagram the box plot shows the median value as a thick line as I said but we're going to class this as equivalent to the mean for now. It's actually the median. It looks pretty close but can we say it's just luck? Are we likely to get this closeness between the two values every time we take a sample of size 30? We need to investigate this. Here is a result if we take repeated random samples of size 30. Notice how it's jittering around quite drastically. But taking sizes of 100, it seems to move less. And sizes of 300, we appear that the variability of the estimated sample means is even less, more stable. Let's see how much this is in the next slide. Here, the box plots have memories. You can now see clearly that the variability between the means for the random samples gets smaller as the sample size increases. The thick, dense lines that are memory are much narrower for the larger samples. 
So what can we conclude from the above information? Well, estimating the population mean appears to become more accurate as sample size increases along with the number of samples. Remember we were taking multiple samples there. Very rarely do we do this in actual research. Next question is, can we quantify this variability somehow? Oh, by the way, I must thank Professor Chris Wiles for his excellent animations. To be able to consider how we might quantify the sampling variability in our sample means, we need to consider a bit of statistical theory. We can be shown that for very large samples, approximately 70% of estimated means will fall within one standard deviation of the true mean. That is the population value. But does this take into account sample size? Luckily, it does when we consider a similar distribution to the normal distribution called the t-distribution. The t-distribution should be thought of as the equivalent of the normal distribution, but this time taking into account sample size and using t-values rather than standard deviations to represent spread. And the sample size is represented by a thing called the degrees of freedom, which I'm not going to talk about now. We remember from the various tutorial how we discovered it was possible to use the area under the curve to calculate probabilities. We can do exactly the same with our standard normal and t-distributions. All we have talked about here though relates to the individual values within a sample or population. What we are really interested in is the variability between samples, so let's move on to see how we can use this for multiple samples. Here is something that might help us understand cross-sample variability. There's a great website which allows us to create multiple samples from a population. Here I've created 10,000 samples of size 5 and 10,000 samples of size 25 each. We've also plotted the means for each sample. And notice that the standard deviation of the means is 2.23 for the small sample and 1 for the larger samples. So the standard deviation of the means of the sample gets smaller as the sample size increases, just as we noticed in the animation before. But now we have some actual values. Now I'll introduce yet another term, the standard error I'm afraid. The standard error is the same as the standard deviation but at the cross sample level. The formula for the standard error of the mean is the standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size. Now applying this standard error formula to our two sets of samples, we end up with exactly the same value that we got from the computer animations. This is amazing. So we can predict the accuracy of our estimate, that is the mean here, by just using the simple standard error of the mean formula from a single sample. Notice we have been talking about means we can calculate standard errors for other summary statistics as well. Remember that whereas the standard deviation is at the sample level, the standard error is just the same thing as standard deviation at the cross sample level. The standard error of the mean, because it's just a standard deviation at a different level, allows the normal distribution to be used, so we can use our normal or t distributions to work out probabilities from it. So let's use all this knowledge in a very practical way. In 1950, Bradford Hill, a famous scientist, measured the mean systolic blood pressure for 566 males around Glasgow and found it to be 128.8 millimetres of mercury, with a standard deviation of 13.5. He wanted to know how precise this mean was, that is, the variability one would expect across samples. Well, this is simply a question of applying the SEM formula along with our knowledge of the standard normal distribution. On the right is the standard normal distribution and on the left is our set of scores. But you will notice that you can convert one to the other quite easily. More about that later. We can see that 95% of the scores will lie within roughly two standard deviations each side of the mean. But in this instance, we are talking about the standard error of the mean values, which is the diagram on the left. This is fine, it just is a standard deviation at a different level, 
equal in one standard deviation in the standard normal distribution. Basically, the two diagrams are the same. We will incorporate this a little more when we look at the concept of a statistic in the next tutorial, but let's move on now. By using the SCM formula with the values we've got, that is 13.5 divided by the square root of 566, which gives us 0.5674, we can say that 2 times this value each side of the estimated mean will give us a quantitative measure of the precise variability across samples that is for around 95% of them. So quoting and slightly adapting Bradford Hill, we may say that our observed mean may differ from the true mean by as much as 128.8 plus or minus 1.134, which is two times our standard error, millimeters of mercury, but no more than that in around 95% of our samples. So, Bradford Hill only needed to take 566 measurements to make predictions about the total population of Glasgow. Obviously, we are assuming that his sample is typical, etc., etc. How much more useful this is than four in-depth qualitative interviews, which uh, someone might come up with. Here we have information that allows us to make rational policy decisions. So how does a range, which some of you will notice is actually what is called a confidence interval of the mean, and in this sense it's around about the 95% mark, have to do with a p-value? Well, the range we've calculated is simply the probability of the mean of the sample being within this middle interval, whereas the p-value is basically the excluded bits of the tails. That is, the p-value of roughly 0.05 is equal to the probability of getting a mean value of 129.93 or one more extreme in a sample of 566 males in Glasgow, given that the population mean is 128.8. And if you don't believe me, you can carry out a one sample t-test with the observed value equal to either of the extremes quoted above, and taking the observed mean as a hypothesized value, and a standard mean as a denominator value, as you would do to obtain the t-value, and the t-value in this sense is 1.99, then looking up the associated p-value related to its t-value with degrees of freedom of 566, we get 0 0.047. Why it's a little under 0 0.05 is because I used the rough and ready approximation of the 95% range of being equal to two standard deviations on each side, when if you want to be picky you should have used the 1.96 value. This would result in a little less allocated to the central area, a little more to the tails. So I think you get the idea. Remember, all this talk about variability assuming we are working with random samples. And while random sampling is a very important aspect affecting the variation of data, the main division in sources of variation is between those characteristics of data and those induced by the research process, a subject we could spend many hours discussing. It is very important that at the end of any quantitative research report, a good discussion section would mention all the above aspects and consider their possible causes and how the researcher's design attempt to minimise and guard against the induced causes of variation in data. So, what can we say from our quick review of random sampling of the mean? The SEM formula allows us to predict the accuracy of our estimate, that is the mean value of our sample across multiple samples, which we can do from a single sample. That is amazing. We can take one sample and predict what other samples will look like. But, of course, this is assuming that we have a random sample, which is the most important thing. The next aspect of the p-value that I'm going to talk about is the concept of a statistic and how this relates to understanding of a p-value. Bye.